Konnichiwa. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, welcome to our session, Agents of Inclusion. We are happy to see so many familiar faces here uh, that found their way to Kyoto, and also so many familiar faces online. Also curious to know more about the new faces that we can see here, and yeah, happy to have you here for our exciting session. Uh, and all those people um, to gather here, some of them uh, who yeah, suspended Saturday night activities to come to the sessions, others that got up really early. And uh, yeah, uh, soon we will hear more about the work and the proposals uh, of community center, digital networks and media. But before this, uh, just some quick words uh, on housekeeping. Carlos. So, uh Hi everyone. So some of the of the common rules that we want to to implement are uh, well the basic ones: be respectful. Uh, we need we need to listen actively. Uh, be respectful for others' participation, even you are disagree. Uh, be collaborative. Recognize diversity. Respect privacy of participants. Ask for consent for photography, audio, visual recordings or quotes. Be aware of language diversity and handle disagreement constructively. So, welcome everyone. Thank you, Carlos. And now the word is uh, with our uh, third facilitator, Shabani, who will also uh, start to uh, present the team quickly. Shabani, are you there online with us? I saw you early in the chat, so, hello. Can you hear us? Can you? We cannot hear you, uh, Shabani? Hello. Yeah, we cannot hear you. Um, there seems to be an audio problem. So, Please try to work on the microphone. I will uh, continue meanwhile with the presentation. Oh. Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. No, again, not. There's something happening, maybe changing the device. So uh, I will. <laughs> There's Electra. No, that's not the uh, uh, Shabani. Maybe raise your arm, maybe you have to be, uh, that's the person who should be uh, able to talk, no? Okay, I will just continue for a second and hopefully you can collect later with us. So, um, the session agents of inclusion will be facilitated by three persons, uh, two of them in the room, the third one mute now, but uh, maybe she will uh, talk to us uh, soon. Uh, so our common interest was to shed light on the great work of community-centered initiatives from different regions and different continents. And together we have done our best to bring uh, together an amazing lineup of speakers. And uh, so uh, first of all, let me introduce you to Carlos Baca sitting over there. Carlos coordinates uh, the training program of Tecu Comunitario. Oh, no. And hello, Shabani? you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great! So I did Thank already you. the first part of your uh, introduction, but uh, you can still introduce Carlos. You can do better than I, I guess. Mm. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is Shabani uh, from India, and uh, nice to meet all of you all there. Uh, so, uh, so my, so I'm. I'm here and I would like to introduce, uh, introduce Niels first. Um, so Niels uh, is a journalist and um, media developer with focus on community media and community networks. And uh, he has an experience as a freelance uh, journalist and a media activist in Brazil, uh, Chile and uh, Mexico. Um, uh, Niels works as a consultant for special uh, projects for Isomatica.org, uh, especially LockNet, member of the Global Innovative uh, Innovation Gathering uh, Network and coordinator of the open source digital newsroom, uh, Colmena, developed by uh, DW Academy and uh, partners together with CSOs in the Global South. Yeah, and uh, we welcome all of you all to this uh, to this session of ours and we look for uh, quite an interactive session uh, with all of y'all. 
Uh, we have uh, other speakers who are also online and I'll introduce uh, them one by one as the session flows. Over to you, Nils. Thank you, Shabani. And so uh, Shabani Belur uh, holds a PhD in democracy and an MA in sociology. She has learned and teached on many universities, too many to mention them all here. Her work involves uh, increasing digital outreach to remote and rural areas of India, women and their usage of connectivity, development of sustainable business models, seeding the growth of community networks, developing community technologies, meaningful usage and utilization of connectivity, and many other um, exciting things things and uh, colors so uh, could you please introduce yourself because there was a, a mix-up um. so hi <laughs> I am Carlos Baca I come from Mexico I work in Rizomatica and in Redes AC two organizations that work with indigenous communities in topics related with connectivity and I, right now I am a coordinator of two training programs uh, one uh, for ICT uh, networks coordinators uh, that we've developed uh, in a joint network with ITU uh, for Latin America and also the National Schools of, of Community Networks, a project that is inside of the local access network initiatives, uh, initiative led by uh, Rizomatica and APC. Thank you, Carlos. And to get the session started, so what is the session uh, about here? So, in many places of the world, the creation of meaningful connectivity, digital content, and also inclusive technologies for internet heavily rely on, sometimes invisible, collective efforts. And we want to make uh, those collective efforts visible today, because worldwide hundreds of community networks deliver access uh, and content to un underserved areas, especially in places where profit-oriented access models are not sustainable. Sustainable. In addition, we have community media, from which we will we'll also know some of them today, media outlets that actively work on innovative digital formats to create more participation and integration with local communities. And finally, we have social enterprises and cooperatives that share the vision of community-owned open technologies. And so our panel will highlight such great contributions, and we will hear again from Shobani uh, how this uh, meetup is going to happen. Uh, so, so we are. So this is a hybrid session, and participation might be a bit different for those online and on-site. Um, we, however, will try to switch always between the two perspectives to create a maximum of exchange that can take place. Uh, since we have a long lineup of speakers, and also want to give space to interaction with the public contributions. Uh, with a uh, will be rather short lightning talks of five to seven minutes each and in q a sessions and in the chat uh, here in the zoom link uh, there will be opportunities to further explore each topics so please feel free to um, ask questions uh, put it up on the chat window of the zoom link after our final q a session we will also make time for a short planning exchange for all of you who would like to participate in the experience to organize the participatory coverage of the IGF using one of the community-centered technologies called Colmena that we will learn more about in our presentations. Yeah, so uh, thanks. Thank you, Shabani. And now we'll uh, come uh, to our first speaker who has stayed up until late in Bolivia uh, today or is postponing dancing. Uh, she will tell us. And uh, please welcome uh, online Michelle Nogales. Michelle is one of the founders of Bolivia's first feminist online magazine called Muy Waso. And Michelle is a social communicator and journalist with a diploma in digital media for education and women's rights and journalism. And she was part of the first generation of Sembra Media's Metis mentorship and Google News initiative. With Muy Waso, she's exploring many digital media formats and let's see what she has brought us today. Michelle, are you there? Hi, Niels. Hi, everyone. Do you listen to me? Yes, we can hear you. We cannot yes. see you, but we can hear you. Uh, how about now? Hi. Great. Thanks, Niels. I can start speaking now, yes? Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with you. Well, right now I'm speaking from a small town in Bolivia in the heart of South America. <laughs> so
So thank you so much for this opportunity. You know, it means a lot to me, to my team. So as I was introduced by Niels, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Muy Guaso, the first feminist digital native media in Bolivia. Uh, we were born in 2018 with a quest uh, to break the old hegemonic narratives of traditional media and tell what was not being told. And we were born in this digital world because in this space, we found an opportunity to talk about the problems, the solutions, and the needs of many women in Bolivia. Working women, indigenous women, and people of sexual and gender diversity who work every day, but whose those stories were not told, you know, or whose those stories are not heard. So at, at Muiwaso, we work to make women the protagonist of their own stories not only through this journalism that tells these stories, but also to a journalism that is able to co-create with our communities, with our readers, you know? And this year we were able to produce a special article on gynecological violence uh, that talks about um, some different experience of women uh, where we had the participation of almost 300 people, you know, that are part of our digital community and these people share their information with us on a topic which there's no open data available in Bolivia. So we made a co-creation of this article together with all these people, you know. And also at Muiwaso, we seek to make this journalism uh, and information very accessible to all, you know. We try to use language that is close to our communities, that is simple, but it's not simplistic or incomplete, you know. And we have this as an unbreakable rule. On the contrary, also, we seek to bring full, verified, and qualified information in data that is understandable and attractive uh, to our communities and has really interesting formats. Uh, in this matter, you know, we also published our third book this year, well, actually, beginning of this year, which is called uh, 31 Myths and Legends of Bolivia, you know, and this experience is really interesting because this book uh, seeks to com compile the mythological oral tradition of our country. And it's a co-construction with people from the community who narrated these traditional stories and young artists and illustrators uh, made drawings, more than 1000 drawings during October, 2022 and spread this oral tradition in their social media. So it was the stories from some people who other um, artists draw and we just made a, an article about each story and then we published a book and this book went back again to the community so it's a whole collaborative uh, production together you know and in this project also we saw this great great impact that can be achieved through organized collective action you know and also this process helped us to maintain a close relationship with our audiences to identify their needs and how they generally generate an impact in our environment. And also, in addition to using the internet as a tool, um, we try to encourage free feminist and independent journalists. You know, we try to share this learning and knowledge that we have gained during this time with members of our communities that live in rural or remote areas, you know. Actually, right now, I'm really, really far from my hometown because uh, today I just came to, to do a workshop with some workers, with some harvesters, uh, really far from my hometown, you know, and we shared about how to use digital media, how to use digital tools to share uh, their own needs and problems, you know. And in that matter, we're actually this year working on creating games or gamified, you know, training experience about media literacy to curb misinformation and the hate speech in the run up to the 2005 elections that are here in Bolivia, you know, presidential elections. So we want to reduce the internet access and usage gap, which in Bolivia is very significant and widening every day. And we want with this uh, Bolivia's digital media ecosystem to grow and strengthen every day. We want the gap in smaller. Sorry, you're breaking up a bit. I think we lost Michelle, uh, but the message came through. Maybe oh, you I'm can. I'm sorry, my okay. internet just got crazy. Am I back? Yeah, you're back now. Thank you. I'm really sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just I'm really in a really small town. <laughs> so we were, uh, I was telling you that uh, we want the Bolivia's media ecosystem to grow, you know, and be like more strong. And we also want to reduce this gap in, um, in access and use of technologies, you know. And uh, we want many more women in sexual and gender diversities to be able to occupy the internet and fill it with their needs, with their initiatives, and also with this diversity of languages and actions, you know, and for there to be diverse ideas and voices that reflect the real demands of the communities themselves, you know. And in this project, I was also working in Colmena, where Niels was uh, coordinating a lot of things and other uh, people who is uh, here in the in the talk and we were trying also to gather a lot of different people who is working from their communities and sharing uh, their own experiences through radio or through other audio um, formats that could get together this idea of communities and to take the internet and to be able to have more diversity of voices um, cutting off this gap that we have in South America to access and to use the internet. So that's for my intervention. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions and we can keep on talking on the chat. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michelle. So our next speaker is James Gondwe. Uh, he is a executive director of the Center for Youth and Development in Malawi, and uh, that organization is, is an organization that works with uh, youth and children and uh, related with digital inclusion matters. So, welcome, James. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be part and parcel of this panel. Uh, as Raitra introduced, my name is James Gondwe, and I'm the director of Center for Youth and Development. Um, our organization focuses on education, but we leverage on ICT and connectivity as well. And we've been exploring ways of how best we can increase access to connectivity and ensure that uh, children, students have access to connectivity and then are able to effectively learn. And uh, one area that we recognize is quite a potential solution in addressing this challenge uh, is community networks. And early on, we did recognize that uh, for us to be able to do that in Malawi, we needed to have a conducive policy environment uh, that would ensure that we are able to set up community networks or people are able to set up community networks. And um, so all along, Malawi has never had, uh, you know, never recognized community networks as, um, you know, as, as, as a solution but also they never had a framework or a licensing framework, a regulatory framework that would actually ensure that community networks are developed. So with the support of our partners, uh, Association for Progressive Communications, but also World Association for Christian Communications, we did work on uh, advocacy, policy engagement uh, with the regulator, but also our Minister of Information uh, to make sure that Malawi as a country should be able to develop uh, you know, a conducive policy and regular environment for establishment of community networks. And despite the fact that what we have at the moment, we would not say it is what we really wanted to see, but I think there is some success uh, because there is a framework that has been created, though not entirely to the way we would have desired it to be created, but there is a framework that has been created. And that would ensure that um, community networks, community initiatives can actually be established in Malawi and that people can actually be connected. So my presentation is mostly focusing on sharing best practices around policy engagement. Uh, what did we do to make sure that we are able to, uh, to get the regulator, but also get the Minister of Information interested and get them listening, and eventually leading to the successful uh, establishment of this policy and regulatory framework. For us, a lot of people would think that it is very obvious uh, that the regulators are aware that community networks are a solution. But it's not. We need to raise awareness. And for us as a country, as an organization, together with our partners, we started with raising awareness. So you start with the basics. Raise awareness about community networks. Get people to know what community networks are. And you know, 
you can do that by sharing examples of where this has been successful. And for us, we did have examples from within the region. So Zenzeleni came in as an example uh, from South Africa. We also had Pamojanet coming in as an example. And later on, Kenya came in as a very good example around policy because Kenya had developed a licensing framework. So we were able to say, look at Kenya, this would have developed. And for us as a country, we can also uh, do something similar. So that was a starting point. And um, so as we are sharing these experiences around best, best practices, it is important for us to make sure that we're also providing evidence. So the evidence is available. Within the country, we know we've got the rural communities that are not connected. And we know that ISPs are not going there because the, it's, not, it's not profitable for them. They would rather stay in the very same communities. So the conventional method of connecting is not working, and we need to provide that as an example. And then another very important element that really worked for us is an element around collaboration leverage on others. So throughout our policy engagement, we leveraged on other institutions within the country. So we leveraged on Mzuz University, University of Malawi, as organizations, as, as academic institutions that supported us with the academic research, uh, you know, and we also did leverage on the ICT Association of Malawi. So the ICT Association of Malawi has got a huge membership of people uh, in ICT, and we were able to leverage on their numbers to be able to convince the regulator to be able to convince the Minister of Information to say this is uh, a solution. So leveraging on, on others is another important uh, strategy that we are able to use. And then another element is in advocacy, it's difficult for you to organize the events on your own. You know, policymakers, regulators, it's difficult for you to find them. Even booking a meeting with a regulator is difficult. But try to engage them through other events. So we targeted the events that were happening within the country, and then we would be able to uh, reach them, contact them while they, they were at those particular events. So a good example is uh, we've participated in a number of um, ICT expos that have been organized within Malawi. And we know for sure that uh, the Minister of Information, but also others from the regulator would be available. And that is the point of engaging you know, with those uh, regulators. Um, Malawi hosted the IGF last year, and that was a great opportunity for us to be able to, uh, to engage with uh, these duty bearers. And even the national IGF is also another opportunity. So try to leverage on what is already happening in your country, and then build from there. Another very important element is to try to build a network of allies. Try to see who else is interested uh, you know, in this topic. So smaller ISPs is another very good example, so much as we may not be fully aligned with community networks, but I think those would be interested and would actually be a good ally. And then also other non-profit you know, entities within the country uh, would be important. So we started building a database of allies from around 2019, and now we are even happy that that particular database has actually developed into a community network alliance. So Malawi has got a community network alliance, and that particular alliance is now going to be looking at how best can we sustain the effort, the momentum that has already been created. So it is the one that is actually so now engaging with uh, the regulator, engaging with the government, and getting them to talk, but also to see the successful implementation of the framework that has been created. So my presentation focused on sharing those best practices. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our next uh, guest from India will be presented by uh, Shobani. Yes. So our next, uh, so our next speaker is Amudan. Amudan is an engineer and an entrepreneur, provide uh, proving how uh, system administration and development can solve real world problems. He currently works with the social enterprise Vakoma developing a technology hot for local communities and their needs. Amudan, let's hear from you now. Thanks. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sarvani, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, you know, go, have a good day, everyone. Uh, and it's, it's nice to be here. I'm glad to be uh, sharing all of our work with you today. 
Uh, at Wakoma, we're working towards um, kind of implementing technology and building solutions to connect the global south. Um, our efforts uh, involve the deployment of open hardware and software, and we create open tools that enable anybody to build a network and adapt it and purpose fit them to their own needs. Um, so a lot of our work involves, uh, you know, uh, a portable, uh, you know, rapidly deployable networking equipment and hardware, but also software and firmware. So to that end, uh, I would like to share with you today a project that uh, we call the Nimble. It's a device that encapsulates all of our efforts in these various different areas. The Nimble is an integration of open source hardware, software, and firmware, and it's designed to be modular, customizable, and portable. Uh, so let's start with the Nimble. The Nimble is, is, is uh, essentially a series of 3D printed mounts and it houses hardware that is chosen to fit within a Pelican case. And what this allows is for it to be taken anywhere and be rapidly deployable and it's extremely portable. And the designs for these uh, opens of, uh, of these shelves and these mounts are all open and anybody can download and print them for use and they can modify them to fit their needs. Users can also design and share uh, their own Pieces. So if they have something that they want to put in the Nimble that's, you know, you know, that we don't already have a mount for, they can design and share it back to the community. In addition to this, to make, these, uh, to make this hardware more accessible to everybody else, we're working on creating parametric designs that change the models dynamically based on the, the specific hardware that you've chosen. So you can uh, you can e much more easily customize it and it makes it way more accessible for people to get started with. And in, as part of this, we, it's also important to mention as we integrate open hardware, software, and firmware and educational resources into this, it's also important to talk about other ecosystem projects that enable us. And uh, we, we're also... The, the Nimble, when it's deployed, we also work with open firmware projects. We leverage uh, OpenWRT, yeah, and what it enables for us is that uh, as part of when you build your own network, you, uh, communities are able to take any commodity hardware they have on hand and use that to, um, to, build, a, um, to build and deploy a network. Um, and at the end of the day, we want to make building networks more accessible. So the idea is you bring your own hardware, software, your own networking, whatever you have on hand, whatever is available to you locally. And uh, you put it together as the nimble and it helps you build a community network. And once the network is up, um, we, we, work, we work on a software platform that we call local uh, to add value to the network. So, um, once you have the network, what do you do with it, right? You need to, you know, there is no point in just having a bunch of nodes connected. It has to serve a function. And to that end, uh, we have local. Local is a software platform that aggregates and enables, again, the rapid deployment of a suite of open source applications that can fit your needs. So this is, this is a short basket of the applications that you can run on local and the, the nice thing about it is you can handpick any combination of these applications that best suit your needs and deploy them rapidly to one or many nodes all at once. And all of these applications can be run offline first. So you can, you can, you can make calls, you can share educational resources, you can run a community forum, you, know, you can create content and share it back to the community all completely offline and local can be deployed on almost any commodity hardware. You can pick uh, any computing resources that are available to you. It could be 
uh, you know, an old computer, it could be a Raspberry Pi, it could be, you know, a little box. If, you're used, if your community has a lot of users, you can scale it up and down as needed, and it can be deployed on most hardware, and you can select the applications that best suit your needs, and you can also include specialty hardware to serve your specific application. And we're always working on adding and integrating new, newer and more open source projects into local. And so if you have an application that uh, you don't see in this list or on our website, chances are that we can probably integrate it and get it working in a short period of time. And much like the rest of the Nimble and the open firmware ecosystem, local is also designed to be platform agnostic. So it runs, it can be run independently of the Nimble. It, the Nimble is independent of local, but they all connect to create this ecosystem that enables rapid deployment of networks along with the local content and services. And this, this type of thing really shines in an offline first environment because it makes building networks for communities that much more accessible, right? When, when these components and the ability to deploy software uh, it kind of democratizes, it democratizes the thing. So people can just come and get started much more quickly. And a great example of this uh, would be the collaboration with uh, Colmina. And Colmina, I think, has been mentioned uh, a few times already in, the, in, this, in this series of talks. It's an offline first decentralized platform that can be used to create and disseminate content in, in a community. So people can just uh, create, edit, mix, um, add text. You know, they can create content, write in Colmina, and then disseminate it out to the community. And as part of the, uh, as part of uh, our collaboration with them, we made a we made a um, a customized Nimble unit which has uh, an audio interface. Um, so you can create and you can take it out in the field. It's less than 100 watts you can plug in a microphone and create content right there and disseminate it in a volatile situation. And uh, so this is a great example of uh, a Nimble being customized uh, along with local integration for a specific use case. And this, uh, this would really enable um, offline first uh, volatile situation. You know, it's, it's a great way to get out news media, for example. And um, and yeah, so this is a uh, this is a nice overview of I think everything we're working on. Uh, we're always open to collaborating, and we actually have uh, we actually have a demo of this uh, Colmina Nimble uh, with Neil. So for those of you that are on site, uh, please check it out. You you should be able to see uh, from Neil. So you can look for the local dot network. Uh, Wi-Fi name, you can connect to it, you can explore the content and services, the platform, you can explore the software. And if you have any ideas and you'd like to collaborate with us, you can reach out to us. You can learn more about all of our various projects on the website. And uh, yeah, well, thank you for your time and your attention. It's a pleasure sharing. Thank you, Amudian. And yes, as he said, the Nimble is set up at the APC booth in the Global Village. So if you want to check it out uh, uh, the next days, it's already set up. And uh, yeah, happy to meet you there also to show you some more of the uh, facilities. But now let's uh, jump to Latin America. And uh, we have someone uh, invited here from Costa Rica, Kemli uh, Camacho. Uh, thanks for having made the long way uh, uh, to Japan. And uh, with the permission of the Indigenous Women Association from Alto Pacuare de uh, Cabecar, Kemli uh, will tell us uh, a little more about uh, social technology designed and maintained by Indigenous women. Um, just a few words, or would you like to present yourself, Kemli, as you, as you wish? Um. Um, yes, very fast, because I prefer to take my time for the presentation. My name is Kemli Camacho. I'm from Costa Rica and I'm the coordinator of La Sulabatsu Cooperativa. 
a 20 years old self-managed uh, enterprise from the social economy. And uh, we have been working uh, during um, now six years with the Association of uh, Cabecar Women to develop uh, communication strategies um, <coughs> and with technologies, but in um, a process of appropriation of the technology. The slide that you are going to see is just to, for you to illustrate the work that we do in this place, because what I'm going to do is to tell you a story. Uh, I would like today to, to talk more about uh, the transformation that a, uh, um, a local communication strategy can make in uh, women organizations. This is what I wanted to address more than talk about the technology. This time I would like to talk about the transformation produced by this technology. I want you to imagine that you are entering in a big, big mountain with no connection at all, no mobiles, uh, no electricity. And uh, that, that takes uh, myself 12 hours walking to arrive uh, to Calabata, this place where we meet all together women uh, from the Quebecar community. Um, I, I want also you imagine this community, uh, uh, each home is at between eight hours to two days walking distance. Then we don't have a center in this mountain where, uh, where you have the home, where you have the houses. Uh, they are totally dispersed in the mountain. And then uh, you have to walk, and if suddenly something happened, you have to walk uh, eight hours. In general, they send one of the kids to one house to the other to let them know that something is happening. And what is happening, for instance, a woman is having a, a, a hard birth, for instance, or there is a, a bridge that, that uh, was... Um, um, fell down because of the river or any other thing, but they needed uh, eight hours to two days to communicate one home to the other. Uh, we, we began to work with them about, uh, at the beginning it was about uh, uh, creating a community network based in, in, in internet protocols. But uh, I'm not going to tell you all the story, but their decision were not, not. We don't want that. What we want is to really have a technology to strengthen in the communication inside the territory and to strengthen in the communication between women because we want to strengthen in the women's organization. This is a matrilineal uh, community. Women are the leaders and they inheritate the land. Uh, then for them to be organized is uh, very important. I want to tell you the last story. This is an authorized story uh, by them. I cannot tell this story without authorization. But uh, two, two months ago, uh, ago uh, a leader drowned in the river. Drowned is a good word, yes? And the body was lost in the river. Um, in other occasion, local authorities will come and look themselves, Red Cross and police, look themselves for the body. In this occasion, women using the walkie-talkie networks organized themselves. And when the local authority came, they said, we don't want you to look for the body because death is very important for us and death ceremonies is very important for us. Then we are going to organize ourselves using the walkie-talkie networks to go alone and organize the community to go alone and look for the body of our leader. And they do that. Yes, they do that and they use... Um, all, all um, along the river, they organized the way that, to try to find the body. When they found the body also, because the authorities ask uh, them, they have to, to, lead, to take the body for the morgue, uh, they also said and organized themselves 
all together talking around the mountains with the walkie-talkie network, talking around the mountains, one to each other, how they are going to define what to do with the body, what to do with the morgue, what to do with local authorities, and how they can and want to do their dead ceremony as they, as they want. Then I wanted to tell you this, this sto simple story, maybe, because it is really the result. In other occasion, if we didn't have this strategy, uh, communication strategy, based in the walkie-talkie network, the, the, the only possibility is the local authorities came and um, took the body and do the Occidental process instead of the Kabeka process and ceremony for death. Then this is uh, one, only one example about how we, um, for, for us the most important is how we are strengthening, we, we together, the, the association, Kabeka Women's Association, and us together we are developing and strengthening uh, the, um, the community organizations led by women. Uh, other, other thing that we have done, and it's related with communication, is about building infrastructure together. Uh, you can see there, the, this is um, Hutsini, and we have just finished it to, to build a Huaraki. Um, those are uh, spaces that we are building together with, or they are building uh, together, um, using all the building, um, the, the building uh, practices. Yes, and they organi are organizing themselves for having, for the first time, uh, spaces to meet safe and uh, uh, for, for women to meet in safe conditions. Uh, then that is also a result of having a communication strategy. Finally, I wanted to let you know that um, they, are, they began um, to develop what they call the Cabeca Women University, which is um, a place in this Huaraki and Huaraki, Huaraki and Hutsini. They are creating this uh, university, Cabeca Women University, uh, where they are teaching agriculture, uh, construction, uh, health practices uh, or health uh, career, um, spirituality and uh, handicraft. These five uh, programs they have created using the second part of our project, which is Okama Sway, which is a platform that contains, contains, this is a bad word, I don't know how to say in, in, in English, but a, a platform with um, where we are collecting all the wisdom of women in Kabekar uh, in Kabekar language and um, in Kabekar language about these different wisdom in agriculture, construction, etc. And um, by the way of uh, audio videos and drawing that John um, John um, women and and boys are doing using interviews to the older women. Then we have this platform and we are using them uh, to collect all this wisdom and to use in this training for the University of Kabekar um, women. Also, I wanted to, to let you know uh, they only speak Kabekar. Then we are using a lot the drawing for agreements or for uh, uh, presenting ideas um, and for um, for making decisions. We are of course interpreters, young women interpreters, but we are using all this uh, drawing as a communication uh, ways of work also. Uh, final, finally, let you know that uh, we began in Halabata. You see, this is our our uh, decision making process. Um, we begin in Halabata. Now we are expanding uh, the the process to other com communities, other Kabeka communities, and also uh, in this next um, next part of the project, we are integrating uh, children to the process also. 
then uh, for now, this is what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Kemli, and uh, thank you also for this uh, trip that you make us uh, go to, to direct to Costa Rica and feel some some of the feelings to be there. No, so uh, the next speaker is Deborah. Uh, Deborah is a, a journalist and activist, uh, and she is the communication associated in the uh, Lognet Initiative led by APC and Rizomatica. She is in Brazil and is very late there, so she preferred to send us a video, and he, she has some great news about uh, uh, a gift for you. Hello everyone, I'm Deborah. I'm uh, joining from Sao Paulo, Brazil today. Uh, I want to start by saying thank you to everyone that's here on site or online uh, to make this conversation happen and also for the organizers, the facilitators and IGF uh, to, to make this space happen. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about a podcast uh, that we just launched this year. Uh, the podcast is named Routing for Communities and we have a motto that says uh, this is an audio journey tracing community connectivity around the world. So this podcast uh, brings life stories of people that are com connecting themselves uh, while defending the fundamental rights and the well-being of their communities. Um, this is a podcast produced by uh, the Local Networks Initiative. This is an initiative led by the Association for Progressive Communications, APC, and Rizomatica uh, in partnership with people uh, with support organizations, with grassroots communities in different parts of the world, uh, especially in Asia, Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, working on the local networks initiatives through the years, uh, we have witnessed uh, a lot of inspiring stories of uh, community-centered connectivity, of community networks, uh, of, of uh, this kind of initiatives uh, that started bottom up. And we thought about the podcast as a way, as a channel, as a strategic communication tool uh, to share these voices and these stories and uh, to bring the reflections uh, to this dialogue, to the dialogue about the future of connectivity and the future of digital technology that we want. Uh, so more than anything, um, we believe this podcast is just an entry point uh, to these voices and these stories that are really, really uh, inspiring. I want to share a brief teaser of this podcast, uh, of the teaser that we made actually to launch the first season now with you, just for us to listen a few of those voices uh, as an example and as, of course, an invitation for you to uh, access our landing page, routingforcommunities.apc.org, uh, to listen to these stories. They will bring uh, different perspectives as the involvement of women, uh, how access inequalities can be related to other inequalities, such as gender, race, and class inequalities. Uh, how can uh, connectivity and digital technology, digital communication be mobilized to promote social and environmental justice? How uh, indigenous people, indigenous communities have been using them uh, to, to preserve the language, the culture. So a lot of different inspired examples from different countries, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, Indonesia, Thailand, Kenya, South Africa, and more. So. Uh, I will just uh, play a bit and with this make an invitation for you to, to listen to these stories and also to share them with people that are interested in this, in this topic. Routing for Communities, an audio journey tracing community connectivity around the world. <laughs> Hi, my name is Renata Porto, and I will follow you along this 12-episode season where we are going to travel to different places, South Africa, Mexico, Argentina, Kenya, Brazil, Indonesia, Nigeria, India, UK, Colombia. Soy de una comunidad que se llama Tepetzalan, del estado de Puebla, eh, país de México. I was born and bred in a village called Mamaila, which is in Limbogo province, South Africa. 
I am originally from Philadelphia in the United States, and then I've been in Mexico since about 2010. Vivo en un pueblito pequeño al sur de Colombia que se llama Pupiales. We will meet stories and voices that are intertwined, connected by a common thread, building internet and communication community networks. So I will stop here just uh, to be mindful of the time. Uh, but this is an invitation. Uh, please, we have also a Telegram uh, channel if you want to join uh, or visit our landing page. We're also in the main uh, audio podcast platforms. Uh, I also want to thank the people that make this season happen. Uh, this was a collective work made by many hands, of course, by those that were generous enough to bring their voices and, and their stories, but also the work behind the scenes. So here are some credits. Uh, and I want to thank you all for being here listening and for creating this space. And I'm looking forward to, to engage with you more. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I don't know if you made it to the chat. And uh, now uh, Shabani will announce our next speaker. Thank, thank you, Vince. Uh, thanks, Deborah, for that. Uh, that nice presentation. We would like to mention that we have uh, keychains uh, present in the room where you are there, uh, as well as in the APC booth uh, with the uh, with the uh, scan. Uh, you can scan the keychain and you can go directly into the uh, into the podcast that Deborah mentioned uh, about. So um, uh, please feel free to collect the keychains uh, from uh, the table. Carlos Baca has it with him there in the room and, and you can also collect it from the APC booth, yeah? So over to the next speaker for today. The next speaker for today is Elisa Hepna and she has joined the foundation in March, APNIC foundation in March, 2023. She has more than 15 years of professional experience in program or project management and the design and delivery of complex projects after working in the private sector, government and not-for-profit sectors. She came to the foundation from the NGO sector where she was responsible in driving the implementation of local, national and international programs in, rela um, uh, in relation to improving education outcomes and literacy using EdTech uh, within a variety of international locations, including Asia and the Pacific. So over to you, Elisa. And uh, her, the topic of her presentation is funding diverse connectivity initiatives in the Asia Pacific region. Over to you. Hi, thank you um, for having me, everyone, um, this evening. Um, my, hopefully, my presentation will come up on the screen. There we go, wonderful. Um, appreciate um, the time that you're giving to me today. Uh, my previous project role, um, I was doing closing the digital literacy divide uh, with uh, solutions, which was um, for primary school children, doing digital um, library solutions to rural and remote areas. So I'm really interested in hearing some of the connectivity and, and discussions that um, everyone's bringing to the table today. But I'm here um, as uh, the Grants Management Lead for the AP Nick Foundation, and I wanted to just share um, some of the great work uh, that we see um, that we're also funding uh, through uh, our foundation and share some of those stories and thoughts that come with that. So how the foundation works, uh, the AP Nick Foundation um, looks to fund um, predominantly through infrastructure, inclusion and knowledge with a goal to have an open, secure and accessible internet for all. And we do that through technical training assistance, community development, grants and awards, internet infrastructure and research and collaboration. So we have a vision to be op to have a global, open, stable and secure internet that's affordable and accessible to the entire Asia-Pacific community. We are predominantly focused in the 56 economies through the Asia-Pacific region. 
And my, we, we're the foundation uh, is made up of a variety of different initiatives, from foundation-led projects specifically to ISAF Asia grants, uh, ISAF Asia awards, and foundation community assistance. I predominantly um, uh, look after the portfolio of the ISAF Asia grants and the foundation community assistance programs. I just wanted to share with you just a brief snapshot of some of those initiatives that are in play at the moment. We've got around 21 different infrastructure projects, uh, 23 knowledge projects and 24 inclusion projects uh, underway at the moment. And over this period, there's over about 200 different initiatives that have been put through our 32 different economies. Some things to, to dive down on are uh, these projects. We've got uh, at least six that are focused on internet and specifically the environment. We've got um, a couple that are focused specifically on disability and inclusion. We've got eight that are looking to fill the connectivity gaps. And when I say remote, we're talking those really remote last, last you know, uh, areas. Um, sorry remote providing those ones is um, we've got some um, internet providers that are supporting through that. Uh, we've got uh, four projects really looking at alternative infrastructure solutions to make um, that kind of connectivity affordable. Uh, a lot of health, a couple of health projects. We've got some at the moment focused on forest fires and what that looks like for climate change. We've got uh, many focused on social impact. Um, we've got IPv6, which is um, infrastructure. And then, yes, 10 on last mile connectivity and 13 around cyber and security. I don't want to speak specifically about the projects. We've got, um, you know, I've got Dinesh here, who is one of our recipients, who uh, works with, is um, manager, well, CEO of... of Servalots, and he's he's presenting uh, on his um, organisation there. But I wanted to try to highlight the fact that uh, we do fund and support collective efforts around community networks and what that looks like, and that can be really really diverse. So these are projects and project solutions that have been put forward to us for funding and support that um, range from uh, this year we've got Pacific Broadband who are connecting 100 educational or health facilities across 10 countries uh, through their solution to, um, you know, Air Jaldi is working in really rural and remote, hard to reach areas of India. Um, Sivisnet Foundation are looking at, you know, how to do small, stable broadband across those islands. We have an a, a company with Distant Curve who is servicing uh, remote rural as Australia that, you know, can cover vast distances, um, but we have very, very, very small population across those large distances. And I think this is trying to... What I'd like to share and highlight is that there are a variety of different opportunity solutions based on context and that we really support that kind of diversity of spectrum and where we, you know, we'd love to support initiatives depending, you know, whatever they are that are um, servicing the community and the community in need. I think the other thing that I've seen come through with our um, projects that we like and that we look to support and some of the conversation that I hear from our recipients is that power is also essential for community networks and, and connecting communities. So as part of that, we do support as well uh, initiatives that are looking at alternative um, power solutions uh, to support that connectivity um, uh, ability to be able to provide effective connectivity for services. So an example there is we've got a project called MeSol who is doing peer-to-peer uh, -peer solar microgrids in Rohingya refugee camps. Um, Satsol is um, in our Solomon Islands which is a transportable um, and tower that uh, can be moved from site to site. 
Um, Common Room, who also do community networks, you know, they are understanding and, and support and look at alternative power solutions, knowing how important that is to maintain that connectivity. Um, and we've got Palau National Communications Corporation who are introducing and looking at hybrid solutions to ensure that there's sustainability um, through power and backup so that that connectivity can continue to occur. And lastly, I just wanted to share a few select selections of our initiatives that are focused on environment and social impact. So this is our inclusion and uh, grants specifically. So we have um, one of our grantees is uh, here, but not in the room. Um, it's an organisation called Simile, and they're looking at how the internet and communications and connectivity uh, can be used for um, climate change and, and water management. Um, we've got the International Research and Exchange Board. There, we funded a Myanmar book aid and looked at language and preservation and what libraries meant in that location to be able to um, support community hubs. Um, we will. We've helped to support ICEA and how building models and uh, community networks and looking at those kind of sustainable uh, models through research and, and funding. Um, and then Davao Medical School um, connecting healthcare uh, um, locations. So that's essentially, um, you know, the diverse range of solutions that are coming to the table. And I just wanted to, to highlight how that has happened and how we support that through those kind of public locations, um, looking at um, power supply, context-specific solutions, leveraging for impact, um, and just, you know, really reflecting on that many projects are ill-equipped with connectivity um, and how do we make sure that we've got that before we do projects. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, and uh, yeah, nice to see this from so from a funder perspective. And if there are other uh, funders in the room thinking about uh, how they can support bottom-up connectivity and content production, I think uh, you already gave some nice examples. And you also touched an important topic that is uh, solar energy and photovoltaic systems. And our next speaker from Germany uh, has uh, yeah a long history of having worked on uh, such and uh, similar technologies. Uh, some of uh, you might have heard. Of, uh, from her already, uh, uh, Elektra Wagenrad uh, will be here with us. She's been uh, developing wireless mesh technology for community networks and solar power systems in Germany, Bangladesh, India, Chile, Tanzania, South Africa. So she has been uh, uh, around the world. Uh, wireless networking, uh, she has uh, 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 published uh, several books and articles on this. Uh, she has also worked uh, uh, on the Freifunk community. Uh, uh, Community and has developed now already the uh, third generation of the Freifunk Open MPPT, uh, an open software hardware solar controller, uh, and she will uh, tell us more about it now. Uh, welcome, Elektra. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, unfortunately, I cannot share the slides with you on the laptop, so I will try with the smartphone. It's fine, but we can see you and hear you clearly. Oh, dear. How do I get out of here? This is the first time I'm trying to do this on a smartphone. Can you see my slides now? No, unfortunately mm -hmm. not. We can only see you, which is nice. Okay, so I have, I just have to go. Unfortunately, I can't show the slides. So I'm a community member of the Freifunk Community Networking Initiative. And in 2017, uh, we I started to work for Freifunk on powering mesh net from solar. So I started to engineer and develop devices 
solar controllers that you can build yourself and that you can program yourself because they're open hardware and open software. So it's open source hardware through and through. And the first devices were like small devices with like 50 watts of power for mobile mesh nodes or independent mesh nodes. And from then on, people keep kept on asking me if they could have more power. So I increased the power and I increased the versatility of the devices. And uh, so there's now three generations of these devices. Two generations are based on an ESP32 microcontroller and they support telemetry. They support extending it with other software. For example, I've made a prototype for APC that is for irrigation purposes. I have a prototype uh, that is monitoring the environment because the solar controller cannot just provide power for your infrastructure. It can also be used to other purposes as well. So it's extendable for these purposes. Yeah, it's a bummer that I don't have my, my slides to show you. And um, one of the devices, uh, an early prototype of the third generation has been used in Antil in India. And uh, it can also be used to serve power to the Nimble project, for example. So the latest device has a power of up to 400 watts peak from the solar system. And it's designed to work with 12 volt batteries but I'm also extending it probably to 24 volt batteries. Um, so far I'm using AGM LED batteries, but I'm also testing now with lithium iron phosphate batteries. And later we have uh, found the slides. Do you want uh, us to show them? Uh, we can show them now. Oh, that would be, that would be awesome. Yeah. I can't see them. Oh, can you see we them? We can see them. The first one is the Freifunk Open MPPT. Uh, it's the. Yeah. 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 So I have my slides here locally. So, yes, <clears throat> that graphic is just uh, illustrating the purpose um, that we wanted to look for in the first place. Like um, two villages and in the middle of nowhere, there is a pot opportunity to overcome an obstacle. And uh, then you, the idea is to autonomously power a, re a wireless relay in a mesh network. So the villages can be connected. Uh, can you go to slide number two? That's the... What, on the picture on the left side, uh, you see one of the first uses. It's a mobile pole with solar power and battery, so which is integrating uh, a mesh potato <laughs> used back right then, and the solar panel and the solar charge controller. And on the right hand, you see uh, the, the, the app that can be used to monitor the device. It will also give you hints if something is wrong. Uh, please go to slide number three. Here you see yeah, the modules that basically such a system is consisting of. Uh, just uh, step over to slide number four. Yeah, just a schematic, a block diagram showing the use in India in Ant Hill. Here um, the device was used to power a Fink Center the 400 watt device and the 100 watt device from the open MPPT was powering the TP link that was connected to the cow mesh. Slide number five, please. So this is a, a current prototype of the 400 watt version. And I'm going to start production this year. Slide number six, please. Yeah, some, some pictures from the field, from the deployment in Antil. Uh, the left picture is when they 
prepared it. And the right hand picture uh, shows uh, the installation. Um, I have to mention that this installation gave problems because the batteries and the device were overheating because they were exposed in a metal box to the blazing sun, which was not how I intended it to be used. Uh, slide number seven, please. Next one. Yeah, I started to print housings for it. And this is a device that you yeah, can use in an environment where it's not a on a remote place. Um, for example, if you use it locally, it's a printed housing. And I added the display. Slide number eight. And here you can see the OSPIT, Open Solar Powered Irrigation Tool, the prototype that I've built based on a what device. And I have the idea to make a PCB for that as well, because I have the feeling that many people will be looking for such a solution. And uh, last slide is just a, a thanks to the contributors, the people that helped me with the funding. Thank you very much. Carlos. Our next speaker is Nwendua uh, Kibuba from uh, Kenya, and he is the is one of the board members of the Kiktanet, that is the Kenyan ICT Action Network. And uh, he's also one of the developers of the Angasa Community Networks in Matare uh, Slums in Nairobi. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. So my name is Mwendo Akiuva from Kiktanet. And I have some slides to, to share, so probably can be enabled to do that. So probably I can give a, a small brief of the Kenyan situation, is that uh, host disable screen sharing, probably you can enable that, is that Kenya has a licensing framework and to get a license for community network, you pay around $50. Uh, so it's a very affordable uh, license that we have. And this was made possible through some collaboration through APC, Rizomatica, Communication Authority of Kenya, and UK Aid. And this license is the one uh, Malawi is referring to, that many other African countries are looking to adapt. And recently, the regulator in Kenya has started cracking the whip on, on unlicensed wireless service providers, so they are being shut down by the regulator. So many of them are now starting to get these licenses. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've shared the screen. So, and also, uh, Kenya has formed a, a, an association for community networks with around 15 members belonging to that association. And they are able to lobby government and other players effectively because now uh, the association has more members and they have numbers to be able to talk to the regulator. Some of the many challenges, of course, we are facing within our situation, power is a big challenge. We have had uh, some speakers speak about power. Like, for example, this is the Angaza community network that we are running in Madare Valley. And this is a situation on the ground. Very many tiny shark uh, tin roofs houses and most of the location is not covered by a power grid. And the power grid that is there within the location, most of them is actually illegally tapped. So the power is usually, usually fluctuates, there are spikes, and these spikes burn, burn most of the adapters for the access points that we have within, within the valley. So unreliable power is one of the big challenges that we are facing as a network. Uh, within, within the network, we have, we have four 
a point of presence, POPs, that we have set up. And the, the different POPs are the ones which communicate to the access points that are on the ground. And one challenge like this network faced is that some of the, there is usually vandalism of equipment. So if you don't secure your, your site very well, probably have tight security, razor wires and all that, uh, you find the equipment gets stolen. So I think this is a challenge either for many community networks, so probably some, some is competitors vandalizing and some is just uh, people looking to, to sell the equipments for money. Uh, another challenge we have, we have seen many community network face is backhaul, uh, because like for a situation, oh, 100 Mbps backhaul cost around $1,000 per month meaning like one giga, gig backhaul will cost around $10,000 per month. And how as we are trying to, to cover the cost of backhaul is to talk to government, because government have excess backhaul, like Kenya, the ICT Authority of Kenya, which provides internet to government sites, and they are free backhaul actually just lying around so one of the things we are doing is telling them if there's a fiber pipe passing near our network or other community networks, why don't you give them that back so that they can be able to serve the members of the community with that internet? And in Kenya, there is an initiative to serve, to provide, to have 25,000 access points within the country. And that's a government initiative. So with collaboration with community networks, they can be able to achieve that target if the government provides backhaul, community networks provide the, the access points and the community people to manage it. They can be able actually to achieve that number at a very lower cost. So that's something we are really advocating and we are talking to the ministry and the relevant government agencies to be able to support that. Um, and within our network, we have several trained engineers uh, who have been going through the schools of community network so that they can be able to manage this network from, from the site. And one challenge, of course, is they, when, when we train these engineers and they are very good, they get poached or they go to larger, bigger organizations. So they go to the bigger ISPs because probably there there's better salaries. So we, we, are, we actually say that we are building capacity for the nation, because you build capacity where people are able to manage these networks, then they go to work for the big ISPs. But of course, we have already built, and built the community and also built human resource for the nation. So we, we don't mind that so much when it's up, it happens. So one of the wins on our POPs, you can see like this solar, this is solar panels within our POPs. Uh, and this, this solar panel are the ones which are uh, powering the masts. But now at the village level, we have access points that have, we have mounted on top of uh, residence, uh, residence houses and we are not able to power all these devices with solar. These are, uh, we have around 250 devices in the, so that they can be able to supply Wi-Fi across the village. And these are the devices that we have problem with, with power because they get burnt out all. So probably the solutions that we have seen discussed here, probably some of them we can try to adapt and apply within our network. Some of the quick wins we have had with this project is support from APC and World Organization for Christian Communicators. They have been able to provide a small funding to, to pay community people who are managing the network for us and maybe even support part of uh, backhaul and this small administrative cost. And of course, one of the other quick wins is collaboration with government and ministry and communications authority. So our regulator in Kenya is very engaging and very available. Uh, so it's actually possible to have the regulator be part of your team. Actually, most of the, our equipment that we have not yet deployed, 
uh, the regulator is the one which, who is storing the equipments for us. And we, we hope that this program can be able to support the government agenda for providing 25,000 hotspots across the country. We have seen people, uh, we, we know that free uh, citywide or slum internet is actually possible. Even here in Kyoto, you go on the streets, there is, there is free Wi-Fi uh, with collaboration with the local municipality. And even if you go to New York, there is free internet provided by New York City. Uh, New, New York City Wi-Fi. So it, this, uh, this, these models actually work and they can also work for info, informal settlement who we can actually help to give internet. We, have, we are targeting to have 20,000 unique monthly users by mid-2024 with this network. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And yeah, uh, we see that uh, solar energy is uh, very important for uh, bottom-up connectivity. And uh, I think we can also see the linkages uh, between the policy work that uh, James mentioned before and how it can create the uh, conditions to uh, make those networks grow. And uh, now uh, let's go back to India uh, to hear a bit more about uh, the work of community networks there and also community media, especially community radios. And uh, someone uh, who can tell us more about it is our uh, colleague uh, Shabani, please. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll just present my slides. Yeah, hope you all can see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I'm going to speak about uh, the the varied uses of community media by women and community networks. And uh, this is something I wear two hats at the present moment. Uh, I am a fellow at of ICIA, that is Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia. And I'm also the Asia Regional Coordinator of the LockNet Project at APC, Association for Progressive Communications. So, um, so uh, all of you all uh, must be knowing about uh, what is community networks or the community-centered connectivity where uh, in regions where there is no connectivity or low connectivity, uh, we try to set up networks that are uh, seated by the community uh, for the community. And in these networks, women's role, uh, play, it's, it plays an important role. Women's, women play an important role. Women play an important role in setting up these networks. One of the things that is very important to understand is that in these networks, women actually play a role of decision making, of setting up the network. Like, for example, they will, they will think uh, whether it has to be uh, they. They, they contribute to the decision process of making the network uh, um, an a online network or an offline network based on various other cat, uh, criteria, which I'll tell you a little bit later. And I think women's role also is that they contribute to a better and equitable network because women try to put up net, uh, the access points uh, in locations where women usually visit, like the like the schools or the or the well where the where they draw water, um, uh, unlike unlike the other. So it's more equitable network, and, um, and it is an understanding of women's capability to use the network. You know, so uh, so here they use quite a lot of frugal technologies that are technologies that are like just a smartphone without any connectivity, but with uh, using the audio uh, recording session, audio recording feature of the smartphone. And uh, it is towards developing enterprises and social entrepreneurs. So in India, we do have quite a lot of community radio in uh, Asia, uh, and I'll tell you examples that serve a lot. Dinesh is there in the room. Uh, Servalots is one of the, one of the organizations uh, and an APC member who has set up a community radio, an offline community radio for the community. And they, they, they are actually, they, they, they have actually set an example, you know, and we have followed it uh, for various other community networks. And this is an offline radio that is, uh, that is set up in the community for, um, for uh, sharing information uh, within the community. 
Then Asor Com in Myanmar that used to be there, but has been as no more there, had a Haisa, Haisha FM, that is a community radio that was set up specifically for the community. Um, and uh, related to all, uh, it related to all the information that the community had and, um, and it is closed down now because of the political um, uh, coup there. Then the Patharti Community Network is also has used community radio and it collects information on biodiversity and it is also an offline network, offline radio. So what happens is that in these in these uh, in these networks that uh, why community radio is used is that uh, it brings the community together and it if you look at the illustration on the left hand side it actually suggests that it brings the community together this type of media it brings the community together and the usage is always a, a usage of frugal technologies that are used like just um, a recording a mic that is used or uh, or a mobile phone with a audio recording facility so it is a very 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 simple type of technology that is used and it also brings a platform for the people in the community to discuss various issues uh, which is which is not there in uh, which internet can you can just plug on to the internet and uh, you can be connected to the outside world but the knowledge that is there within the community it uh, it re it really requires some of the knowledge um, uh, can be recirculated within the community sometimes the community doesn't know it and this indigenous knowledge sharing is uh, is sort of um, uh, used quite a lot through the use of the community uh, radio. And uh, we have examples of indigenous knowledge like uh, art and craft forms, which the community doesn't want to go into the internet. And it should remain within the community and get enhanced by the contribution from the people in the community. And this happens within the, within the community radio space, that, the platform that it provides. So I just uh, give you an example of a network, uh, uh, offline network uh, diagram, a mesh network diagram, which is uh, here. And you can see that how, how, the, how the radio is used, how the information, various types of information is collected by the community in an offline setting. And it attributes to the community knowledge. What happens to the women is that women have find uh, self-expression through community radio. You know, otherwise they don't have, their voices are never heard in the online uh, medium and it sort of gets diluted. But in the community radio space, women find self-expression. They can, they can speak, they can speak for themselves. And of course the community support is also there. The local community linking up the local community to the outside world. And um, as you can see, preserving indigenous knowledge in one of the networks that we are going to set up very, very soon now, we are going to use a combination of um, Nimble and Colmena for setting up, setting up a network for preserving languages in a tribe, uh, in, a tribe in, uh, in a remote part of India. Uh, where the language is totally getting uh, eroded. It's not there anymore. It, it, it is, they don't have a repository also of, the, of its own. So we are setting it up over there. And the community contribution to the knowledge repository is, only, is going to be only through this community radio, which is again going to be an offline network that we are going to set up. And um, what happens is that in these, through this type of community media, what happens is that women who are uh, perceived to be not having digital uh, literacy um, uh, or not having devices, so they can adapt themselves to technologies that are very frugal and simple to use. Uh, and that's from me. Thank you. Thank you, Shabani. And, uh, 
now to our, our next speaker. Uh, I already wrote in the chat, if you have questions, uh, we will get to our uh, questions answered on quickly. It has been uh, many presentations, but uh, uh, yeah, I think very interesting insights and two more coming. So um, now we will have Eric Huerta from uh, Redes, uh, Mexico, and also from uh, Rhizomatica, and uh, he will uh, tell us a bit uh, about the work, uh, interesting work uh, doing in Mexico. Hello. Hello. Well, thanks a lot all for um, all the experiences that have been presented are such inspiring and interesting. Um, and, and well, it's, uh, it's good to, to hear that we share sometimes common problems, no? When we talk about electricity, when we talk about the access. And uh, well, uh, I love uh, all the presentations, but especially I, I like the one um, from the Quebecer woman. In <laughs> because it's, uh, it reminds us a lot the context that we uh, also work with, uh, with indigenous communities. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you um, uh, the story, our, our own story about what is happening now, we, 12 years ago, more or less, or 10 years ago, we started a mobile network, no? uh, a, a community mobile network for indigenous communities. So was, that was a, um, at that moment was a hit, no? because uh, it was the first time a community, uh, indigenous community got access to Spectrum for mobile services. And uh, and then, well, uh, we started 2G uh, services in, in indigenous uh, communities from Mexico and the area of Oaxaca. But, well, uh, it has been 10 years uh, since that. Um, and, well, things have changed a lot. And uh, also technology has changed uh, a lot. And we have uh, new challenges and new also new opportunities with this. So especially after the pandemic, we have we seen an increase of the, um, of the, expa the expansion of um, big operators in Mexico. So in some of the communities that we used to provide, well, the communities used to provide service for themselves, uh, some big operators start coming into. And that, uh, well, it's difficult to compete with them because um, these local networks has a specific type of, um, of numbering, so they don't use the same numbering for like the other uh, communities, and some people switch them because they're not national networks. So one of the things for us was to see how shall, shall we do? Are we going to continue with this project or we don't? No? So the first thing that we did was to, as every year, uh, all the communities met together and we explained the situation, what was going, and they decided to continue. They say we, we're going to continue with, with, the, with the networks, but um, um, each time we have to move the local networks to the smallest communities. So that affects the uh, sustainability of the network because the big um, the big communities sustain the small communities. No, but if all of them are small, well, then that's a problem. And the other option was also to create a, a mobile virtual operator so that the communities did not lose what they already have um, a share within the, within the um, calls that were done in the community. So we create this mobile uh, virtual operator and we, con we continue with um, building infrastructure within small communities. But this thing of the mobile virtual operator also brings us new opportunities as well. Uh, when we started these networks, we were so excited because we think that we could do a lot of side projects regarding to content creation or local economy development and that. But the real thing was that um, most of the time and, uh, and energy of 
um, kept in sustaining the, the networks, in, in uh, attending the services and uh, um, ensuring that the network was more reliable and so on. So we have less time to, to work on these side projects. So the mobile virtual operator brings us these opportunities and uh, also um, the, then this, uh, this mobile virtual operator has uh, two, it's not just about providing service, but also to support content creation for the communities and also um, local product exchange. I would just quickly tell about two of these experiences that um, are there. One is from a community, it's called Calpulalpan, and this community say, well, we have our um, mobile non-virtual operator now, we provide service to the community, but we, we would like to, to have a um, local information center for our uh, communities, and that's why I was uh, I refer to to these local networks and the ones like the Quebecer has, because for instance this community um, has um, run a long history fighting against the mining in their communities. No, so uh, they want to share these experiences, these experiences to to the new generation, so that they continue to to remain strong against the. Um, yeah, the invasion of the lands and so on. And uh, so we are working with them, creating um, this, well, started this project, creating this facility so that they can have their, um, their local uh, maps, their local um, information center to provide this in a local network. So this, the, the, this has been an important change. No, it's not just about now that we don't have to sustain the infrastructure, we can engage uh, uh, in different projects that can develop local content using the resources that come from the um, virtual operator. And the other is um, the strength in local economies. No? So the model that we use within the mobile virtual operator is kind of a service. Um, um, it's kind of a... a Local savings group, no, like a local savings group. So uh, this is this, this other story is a, um, a, a local uh, university, a community university, and it's, it's mainly a, a peace and university. So they have a um, a special area for communications. They are about six to seven students, they're small students, and they decided to, to, to create this uh, group to, to become a mobile reseller no? from the mobile operator. And th so it was interesting because they, uh, they have saved some money some, for some production that, that, they, that they did, and then from there they started the, their MBO. You know. And with, with that money, uh, well, it was very successful because at that place was the only operator. Is that it? one? Okay. Um, well, it's, it was very su successful because it was the only operator there, so a lot of money get started into the income. And now they are uh, become a, a self... Um, and they, um, they, have, um, they are now uh, founding themselves to... Um, support the acquisition of the yeah, their computers and their, their own mobiles and so on. So, I mean, that's uh, what I wanted to share, this, this change from uh, the local network to a virtual operator that moves into some different areas of the self-sustainability of the community. So, that's, that was all. Thank you, Eric, and sorry, yeah, uh, we had to have to watch the time a bit because we have uh, still one speaker, uh, Risper Rose, uh, waiting uh, online, and uh, Risper is uh, from a CBO from Kenya called uh, Tandanet, uh, some of them might know you, and uh, she will uh, tell you uh, quickly uh, about a project that we heard mentioned already a couple of times, Colmena, uh, where mm -hmm. uh, several organizations uh, that presented here today are involved, it's like a, a common effort, uh, for uh, an open source software and uh, 
uh, yes, Risper will tell us more about it. And thank you for your patience, Risper. The, the floor is yours now. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Niels. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this conversation. And uh, just to commend um, the great presentations that I've heard from the different speakers a lot. Um, I could resonate because we also have a community network and also we've worked with Colmena. So um, a lot of synergy uh, also from the conversation uh, from the different um, uh, speakers uh, that are presented. So I'll just share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. It's still loading. Yes, now we can see it. Yes, so uh, briefly, um, I'll, I'll talk about our work, what we do um, in Kenya. And mostly it's just an addition to what uh, the previous uh, speaker, Kibuva Mwendoa has um, as, as, as spoken about painting a picture um, on the lands, uh, landscape of uh, community networks in Kenya. Um, and now I will uh, talk about um, um, a community network based um, in the informal settlements of uh, Nairobi, uh, that is Kibera called Tandanet, where I, I, I work. Um, yeah, so um, Tandanet is, um, um, is a community network that is dedicated to creating a digital ecosystem that combats digital inequalities within marginalized grassroots communities. And um, uh, we also uh, do this through multifaceted approach where we provide affordable internet access, enhance digital literacy, uh, develop digital platforms, and also collaboratively create locally relevant content with the community. Uh, from the picture uh, that you can see, that's how the landscape is. Something um, very similar to also um, uh, what was shared um, uh, with the previous speaker. Um, the uh, Kibera has 13 villages and um, the exact number of residents is not uh, determined, but ranges between 170,000 to 1 million people. Um, and with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there was a lot uh, that was highlighted, especially around um, the ongoing problem where the many low income communities lack reliable or affordable um, um, access to connectivity and uh, hence, hence they were being left uh, further behind since most of the services were moving online. And um, there are most uh, internet uh, providers that offer affordable uh, data packages um, in the community. Uh, the problem is um, just that it's not very reliable or very feasible. Um, and also the quality uh, of the mobile internet um, can be poor at, at sometimes because of poor infrastructure, um, yeah. So um, what you can see also is a mast. Um, the the mast um, is located actually in um, in our offices, and our offices is at the is is at one of the community schools. Uh, that is where we are located. Um, so um, our programs, um, our work uh, revolves in two folds. So as I had mentioned, we have uh, the bit around access, uh, providing affordable access. And here we um, currently, we have connected 60 centers um, in nine villages out of the 13 villages in Kibera. And our goal is um, um, in, the, in the near future to reach, um, uh, to connect the, uh, the, 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 the 13 uh, villages uh, in Kibera. And also uh, we provide internet connectivity to community schools, CBOs, NGOs, community hospitals, community business, uh, youth, youth and women, uh, uh, women groups. So initially it was more around um, um, organized groups uh, that we were engaging with. But starting this year, we have started uh, connecting homes and individuals. Um, our path to sustainability, um, um, we have paying clients where um, the first is we offer um, 
public hotspot internet access for communities um, for as low as um, $0.5 dollars a day. Uh, also, we provide fixed internet services to um, the community centers that I mentioned at the rate of uh, $15 a month. And with this, they get unlimited um, internet speed of up to 40 Mbps per month. And out of the 60 connected centers, 41 um, are uh, making regular payments um, and the rest are not. But the beauty about community networks is um, the co-creation process. So figuring, figuring out uh, with the community who cannot be able to pay for the internet what um, uh, what avenues would uh, make sense for them so that they keep connecting uh, regardless uh, of that state. So really looking at also the idea around anchor clients who can um, pay for the, um, uh, the internet in, in terms of um, the, the uh, standard rate, that then that can support um, our clients um, or, or the community who are not able to, uh, to make regular payments. Also, we offer network trainings to the communities, um, and these trainings are designed to educate the centers uh, with basic um, uh, skills around uh, networking concepts, networking management, troubleshooting, and security practices, uh, so that uh, in, in, in case the internet is down and um, there is a troubleshoot that uh, needs to happen at the center level, then the community uh, that you connected are able to do that. Um, yes. So um, beyond Kibera, our work also look at, sorry. Um, beyond Kibera, our work also look at, um, uh, sorry, just give me a minute. Our work also look at, uh, um, um, mentorship training and mentorship program where we have trained over 200 individuals from 11 community networks in Kenya. Those are um, organizations that either, either emerging communi uh, community networks or already established community networks on what it takes to design, deploy, operate, and sustain a community network. Um, and this is a project also that uh, was supported by um, uh, uh, the co by APC um, called Supporting Community-Led Approaches under the LockNet uh, Initiative. And then after, so beyond the um, uh, access, uh, beyond the internet access, we also do a lot of um, um, activities around capacity building the community. So we engage the community uh, through human-centered design to um, uh, to focus on what their needs assessment is, and then through that um, uh, design trainings that will then um, uh, support them in meaningful access of this technology. Uh, we also look at diversity, so looking at uh, from these centers that we have connected, um, how, are, how, is we, how are women are relating to the technology and how are men are relating to, to the technology and if there's any um, um, extra efforts that needs to be made uh, for a certain group to be able to um, uh, meaningfully access the technology, then we create and uh, we co-create with them um, uh, some of these um, capacity building efforts. Uh, also with this, just promoting ownership and control by the community. And this we do through um, local content creations and platforms where we encourage the community to not just be creators of digital content, but also to be um, not just to be consumers, but also to be creators of this content. So we do, um, after the trainings, we think through what sort of um, podcast we can create so that um, it can be accessed by the general community uh, uh, beyond the connected centers uh, that we engage in this training. We've also created comic strips, videos, uh, just to showcase some of the work and amplify the voices of these community centers that uh, we are connecting and also the benefit, uh, the role of uh, internet in amplifying uh, their work. Um, also, um, we have created knowledge management platforms which compro, uh, comprises e-learning platforms and also school management platforms. And um, um, uh, in 2021, we introduced Colmena um, to the community network as an as a tool, um, as a tool for local content uh, creation and sharing. 
So um, um, here I'll just talk briefly uh, about Colmena. Um, so after connectivity, uh, community members need locally relevant content. And that is where um, uh, Colmena come in, where uh, we, um, we have worked um, in three phases. Uh, in the um, in the first phase is was uh, was when we first interacted with the platform and we did uh, user uh, use user experience and user interface testing with the community medias just to understand what are some of the gaps that they are facing um, um, as 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 uh, community media and how um, and how is called Mena um, a tool that can be able to address those gaps and. And from that, um, we uh, the the platform was uh, we got really good uh, feedback that went ahead to um, um, to contextualize the platform, um, and also we've done workshops on. Um, creating a uh, workshops on creating awareness of Colmena, where we've invited uh, the community media and even community networks uh, that we've worked with uh, in Kenya to just un um, um, understand what Colmena is and see how it plugs best to their work. And currently we are uh, on the third phase and uh, we are looking into localizing and contextualizing the tool by creating an instance uh, of the tool um, that will be locally hosted uh, in, in Tandanet uh, that is based in Kenya. So looking at that, uh, seeing how the tool can then be, um, um, uh, can serve um, with its feature that is um, online, uh, off, online or offline, and be able to really contextualize some of uh, this engagement uh, that will be on, ongoing at the co at the community at the community level. So um, those are what uh, we are doing with the platform Colmena, and of course, uh, just benefiting from uh, the cost efficient uh, and affordable solutions that uh, it has to the grassroots community. Also, uh, the fact that it addresses the need for more urgency on the community level to ensure uninterrupted, safe and secure access uh, for the information and also improve the local uh, collective ownership um, at the last mile uh, level. And lastly, just to build or contribute uh, to the resilient uh, decentralized infrastructure uh, through um, the ownership uh, of, of the community. So I don't know how I'm doing with time. I don't think I'll go, I'll have time to go through my last slide, Mills. Yes, uh, very quickly. I don't. Uh, yeah, we have five minutes left on the on the session, and then we have to wrap up. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Just uh, key areas that are from our from our reflections, uh, we thought that needs a lot of uh, attention is um, number one, uh, co creation, especially with um, the community uh, needs time, uh, especially when you're introducing uh, platforms, when you're introducing local content, when you're introducing um, decolonization uh, of, of this con uh, content. It needs time and it needs patience with the community. Also, um, uh, there's need to join voices with like-minded individuals and organizations and aligning capabilities and sharing resources in order to promote digital inclusion. And lastly, uh, we uh, need to actively participate in evaluating uh, some of this digital inclusion, uh, um, digital inclusion efforts, considering the gender, different race, um, and uh, control at the grassroots level so as to participate all, and also to participate in, in such spaces to strengthen the resilient um, uh, digital infrastructure and community participation. So thank you so much, uh, even uh, to our supporters and um, um, yeah, looking forward to you. Thank you, Risper. And uh, yes, it was a, a big lineup of speakers, so <laughs> we, it took almost all the two hours, but interesting insights. And uh, I think this room, um, there won't be much time now for, for questions. Uh, I don't know if, if there's anyone who, who has one. Oh, okay, uh, over there. And then I would say also, uh, let's take the time later at the gala or at the booth uh, in, the, in the village to continue our dialogues. Yeah, thank you. So it was really interesting, but I have I have one question. I don't know who, who wants to answer it. So we have more layers than the, the, the network layer, the technical layer. We have also the regu regulation layer. We have the content layer, uh, the administration, and, and the whole conference is talking about disinformation. And 
how do you distinguish between these layers and how do you make sure that, that your networks that you are building not in the end being misused when the number of users and active users are growing? So what, what measures do you have in place for that? I mean, I'll add one more layer, which is who are left out when we say participatory, you know? The community is participating, but who are left out? So I'm coming from the point of like low literacy and how do they engage and how do they uh, become part of the content creation process or content engagement, you know? So. Any takers for those uh, questions? Oh, more? Okay, uh, this was a question to um, Wendua and probably Rispa. Uh, we are talking about um, network in the informal settlements. And I wanted to know the level of the quality of the internet provided by these communities, uh, but also in terms of connectivity, uh, I wanted to understand, like, once an installation has been done to a house or a unit, what is the consistency in terms of paying the subscription by you, the, the specific houses so that we get to understand, is, is it affordable to them? What is your feeling about them paying or... Um, what is your feeling about the consistency of using the internet provided to this household? And that will also inform when you're talking about accessible and affordable and available internet, what does that mean? Looking at the context of the communities we are targeting. And the question on the quality of the internet, we've had experience where internet quality wax in the middle of the night. What is the experience with that? Thank you. Okay, any takers for the questions? We can maybe start over there and then yeah, everyone has a, a quick final say. Yeah, just uh, maybe I could talk a bit about the layers of the... Uh, the more sophisticated this gets the network, the more layers that it has to attend. You know? And I think that if we have to 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 think about the small economies or the um, economies for subsistence economies, how do they work? And they subsist that they are because they work collectively. You you won't make it if you think just in 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 oneself or in just one person. So the first thing that we did when we started was to look around who were working on these different areas and then discover who who was better for doing what or who was better for doing things. And I think that's that's the case of Lognet. Those that that was how Lognet uh, was born after thinking in well after meeting together and think about all these different legends and how we attend. They were more there were people that was more experienced in regulation, was more experienced in technology and that. And so with that, we have been organizing as a network to, to help us and prevent on, and subsist within these small different networks because try, trying to attend everything one network would be impossible. No? Good. Uh, Danish, um, Tabekar culture is not a written culture at all. They don't have a uh, written, uh, only in the university they have tried to write, to, to create a written for the Kabeka culture, but their culture is not written at all. Then uh, what we use, uh, the platform, Okamasway, the platform that we use is only audio and image, okay? We don't use writing at all because it's not part of the culture. And um, also, we use a lot of drawing. Uh, drawing is something very crucial for this interaction, especially because I don't speak Quebecer and they don't speak Spanish, yes? And we have the interpretator, which is the younger women, yes, that, that speak both. 
But we communicate a lot using drawing. Then uh, th those are the, the strategies that we have used, but we use a lot of uh, recording, video, images, drawing, photos, yes? And with that, we have created the platform of uh, wisdom of the women, the Kabeka women. Thank you. I'm really sorry, but I was just informed that we run out of time. So the last question, we will have to, to take it uh, outside if we, if we can do. Would you uh, help uh, to, to answer it later, James and uh, uh, Kivuva? Okay, thank you. And uh, for all of those who are still around uh, and who want to know more about Comena, about the uh, content creating, uh, creation software that we saw, uh, uh, we will test it here during the events. So, uh, anyone uh, who wants to have like an account and also to, to help uh, for participatory coverage, you will find me at the APC booth, and uh, then uh, yeah, let's let's talk about it and uh, create some content together. And thank you all, all who were there online, uh, on site, who contributed to this uh, session. I think it was a really nice uh, insight into all the interesting work done. And yeah, let's take advantage of the uh, next four days here to uh, inform more about uh, the work done by and for uh, communities, networks, and media, and engage in the discussions and make this our. IGF. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.